We're talking with uh, Thomas Simmons here, who's a Libertarian candidate for the U.S. House District 1 in Massachusetts. He's going to be on the ballot November 8, 2016. And again, his website is Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S, the number four, congress.com. Thomas, thank you for joining us today and, uh, you know, being here for our audience to know that there are other options, at least in District 1 in Massachusetts. And we've interviewed about um, 25 people so far across the country. And uh, and you're someone giving your district another choice besides a Republican or Democrat. And so welcome. And how come you're not running as a Republican or Democrat and you're running as a Libertarian? And why did you decide to run this year? Well, first, let me thank you. I think this is a great service that you're providing, especially for those of us who are running as third-party candidates, um, because it's, uh, it's often hard for us to break through <clears throat> the uh, the mainstream media uh, and get our get our opinions and get our voices out there and let people know there actually is a choice. Um, I chose to run as a libertarian largely because I have uh, major differences of opinion with both the Republican and the Democratic parties, and I didn't feel comfortable throwing in with one of them simply so I could have a major party designation next to my name. Uh, I generally believe uh, that government ought to be out of your out of your bedroom, out of your wallet, out of your backyard, out of your business, and I find myself much more in tune with the Libertarian Party than, than either the Reps or the Dems. So that's why I chose the Libertarian Party. Um, I chose this year because there's a uh, a groundswell of dissatisfaction with both of those parties, uh, and I'm also retiring after teaching for 19 years at the community college level. And uh, it just seemed like the right time and the next step to take in my life. Yeah, and it, on your website here, uh, Simmons, the number four, congress.com, if there was ever a year for credible and capable fresh blood to represent Western Massachusetts in the U.S. Congress, 2016 is it. And, this um, is it. So, and it has a little bit of you know, your we, bio we, here. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, we, this is a year, first of all, this is a year where the presidential uh, candidates, the, the major party presidential candidates, have uh, have the least level of support by the American people. We have more people who are independents. And then on a local level where I'm running, I'm running against someone who's been a career politician who's been in the same office for 27 years, usually without any opposition whatsoever. And uh, he, he's a Democrat, and even people in his own party are tired of his inattention to the district and tired of his assuming that he uh, is just the heir apparent to the district every year. Um, so, as I said, th- this is definitely the year. Uh, by way of background, uh, I've been a community college teacher for the last 19 years, teaching economics and business at Greenfield Community College. Uh, I'm also a founding faculty advisor mem- advisory member of the Grinspoon Entrepreneurship Initiative, which is a private foundation in Western Mass that helps uh, college students start their businesses, helps them with business plans, helps them with seed capital. And uh, I've been working with hundreds of students over the last two decades to help them get new businesses started and up and running, some some very successful. I'm also a uh, member of the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary, Uh, I'm solely responsible at this point for making sure the navigational channels on the Connecticut River in Western Mass are clear and free from obstruction uh, so that we have safe navigation for boaters going up and down the river. I'm past union president where I work. I've served on the Town Conservation Commission in my hometown of Shelburne, and I've served in the board of directors of two different HIV service agencies. So for me, uh, it's not a case of someone just saying, "Hey, I throw, I'll throw my name into the, into the, you know, into the ring and see what happens." I've been involved for the last several decades in my community and in my region, and I think I offer a credible alternative to the major party candidate. Yeah. So I mean, I just heard your bio there, and people can read it. Um, you know, you, you actually there's more in there than than what you just said, but. Um, and a very, you know, a credible candidate compared to someone who, you know, has pretty much been in Washington their entire career. And so that's one thing I have noticed. A lot of these 
third options, independent candidates um, do have a lot of credible life experience. And, uh, you know, so I guess people are going to have to decide who's the best choice. Have you had any debates yet? Are you going to have any debates or more debates in the future with the um, I would love to have a debate with my opponent. I've I've called our local TV stations who and I've requested that they try and uh, set something up. Uh, some of the local newspapers have criticized my opponent for not being in the district and not being around, and have called him to uh, called him to account and said you need you need to show up and you need to uh, you need to debate this candidate. Um, he has ignored me completely so far. And I've been out in the district for months at this point. Every, I have a very large district. There's 85 towns in this district. It's the largest one in Massachusetts. It's the entire western third of Massachusetts. I've been at uh, town-sponsored meet and greets, library meet and greets, county fairs, senior citizens groups, gay groups, uh, labor dinners, um, you name it. And he never shows up. Wow. It, 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 you know what kind of I wonder what would make him show up? I, I mean, um, you know, he obviously probably feels it's safer not to have a debate. And, and that's, you know, questionable. Um, but it re- kind of reminds me of like um, like a Rocky movie or something like someone wanting to challenge, you know, the person who has a heavyweight belt. And, and if someone keeps challenging them and if, if he refuses to, you know, go in the ring, then. By default, you know, in a, in a way, at least of public opinion, the person who refuses to defend their title um, loses. And uh, so maybe, I don't but, know, there's some kind of analogy And that is, that is beginning to happen because, as I said, I've been in a lot of these small towns, uh, and I've spoken to a lot of town officials who are normally uh, faithful Democrats, and they're disgusted with them. And uh, they asked me the same question you asked me. Is he going to debate you? Is he going to show up? Is he going to, uh, you know, tangle with you? And my answer, unfortunately, is based on everything I've seen so far, no, he's avoiding me. And they just roll their eyes and say, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty typical. We don't see him either. Let me ask you this. How many debates would you be willing to have? What do you think would be, with this amount of time left, 40, 41 days, 42 days remaining, how many debates do you think – Ideally, there should be from now. Let's forget about the past. There probably should have already been two or three debates. But how many debates do you think, ideally, realistically, there should be in the remaining 40? I, I can see two or three um, d- debates um, uh, that I could have with him if, if they were shown on local, uh, the local TV stations and, and written up in the local newspapers. We could spend one entire debate just on uh, social and domestic issues one entire debate on foreign affairs, foreign trade, international issues, and then probably one entire debate just on local issues. Um, we have a number of very specific local issues in attempt uh, to build a, a, uh, a pipeline, a uh, Trans-Canada pipeline through western Massachusetts. We have a watershed that's in danger of contamination because of a, a toxic spill. Um, so there's a lot of local issues as well, that are just very specific to my district. So uh, I'd say a, a good three debates would be appropriate. And let me ask you, I don't want to ask you to pledge anything, but let's just say, <laughs> let's just say you were elected in 2016, November 8th. And two years from now, you know, you have someone wanting to challenge you, wanting you to be in the debates. Can you promise to be in the, you, you know, to give them the opportunity to have debates like you want to, be in the debates this year? I'll take it even one step further. Not only will I agree to that right now, flat out, I also intend on having a series of town meetings within this district throughout the year on a regular basis, perhaps once a month the entire time I'm in Congress, so that I'm in touch with the people of the district. Well, that sounds really good. Now, let me ask you this. What is, um, and actually, since you brought it up, that I'd never heard of that, you know, um, Canada, Massachusetts. Uh, can you explain that? And what's your position on that? 
Oh, well, like many places in the country, you know, many people have heard of the Keystone Pipeline, and uh, there's been a controversy in uh, North Dakota with the Dakota Pipeline right now. Uh, We've got, you know, a similar issue where uh, a number of different companies have been interested in building a new natural gas pipeline uh, through western Massachusetts in order to bring natural gas to Boston. Uh, And for those of your listeners who are not residents of Massachusetts, Boston is not the entire state. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of us who live in the hills and the woods way in western Massachusetts on the Vermont border, and that's where my district is, um, and that's where they want to put this through. Um, for me as a libertarian, it's a, it's a very, very easy issue, and that is the pipeline cannot be built without the use of eminent domain to take private land. If you're go- And as far as I'm concerned, eminent domain to take private property to give it for the use of a private company who will make a private uh, profit off of that is absolutely unacceptable. It's a no-go from the start. All right, and I could totally hear that position, and so that sounds pretty clear. And actually, I do want to ask you your issues here. Um, Just go through them pretty quickly here. Um, All right, so we'll start with – this is on your website under the solutions section. What about civil liberties? Um, You did write about civil liberties. Are you a civil libertarian? Uh, How are are you going to take seriously your pledge to defend and protect the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, et cetera? I am am a very – first of all, a little bit of background I did not give you. Uh, I'm an attorney. I graduated from Hofstra Law, the same Hofstra that the debate was at the other night. Uh, back in 1984, and I am an absolutist on the Bill of Rights, uh, and that means the freedom of speech, period, not free speech zones and not free speech only if we agree with you or only if we think it's not dangerous. Uh, it means uh, freedom of assembly without getting a permit and getting approval beforehand. It means your Second Amendment rights, uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, period. It means no warrantless search and seizure. It means a Fifth Amendment right to refuse to answer uh, to authority, even without saying, I'm asserting my Fifth Amendment right. You have that right. And every single one of these rights has been, has been chipped away at, has been peeled away at uh, by the right and the left. Um, from uh, starting with the Patriot Act and uh, government surveillance over telephone calls and library records to Supreme Court decisions that have given the police broader powers to uh, investigate and search without a warrant, without real probable cause, to uh, efforts to restrict uh, firearm ownership, Uh, to efforts to create free speech zones or outlaw hate speech or um, decide that uh, press rights are are not as free as they ought to be. The the whole effort to jail Snowden, who should, as far as I'm concerned, is a hero um, and and not a a traitor. Um, Every one of these rights has been chipped away at always in the name of security. And I value liberty over security. Yeah, I mean, I think it was the Democrat Senator Russ Feingold who said when they were passing the original Patriot Act is uh, something akin to, you know, we could be totally safe, but then again, we would be living in a fascist society or something like that. And he was one of the few Democrat senators exactly. to vote against it. And um, and so, I actually like Feingold a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of consensus that could be built, and I'm going to ask you about consensus. Um, at the end here. Now, you did have another issue about taxes and wages. Um, very interesting uh, proposal here. Can you explain that? Sure. I, I have a rather unique plan because I, I think that the, the Republicans are right on some things, but ro- really wrong on others. And I feel the same way about the Democrats. I think the, San, uh, the Sanders Democrats have appropriately identified uh, wage disparities in America as being an issue. And, and actually, both Sanders and Trump have tapped into uh, the discontent with the fact that wages for most Americans have been stagnant for decades. And even though they say the unemployment rate is getting lower, 
the fact of the matter is uh, at least one in four Americans are now making less than they did just a few years ago because they're cobbling together part-time jobs. And for yeah, every unemployed... The bar differently. Excuse me? I'm sorry, they set the bar differently. So, yeah, yes. what they used to consider, <laughs> yeah, they've changed the number, they fudged it around. If you're working yeah. part-time, you're no longer unemployed, period. And for every person, whoever, for every man who is unemployed, there are three men who are no longer in the labor force, so they don't count either. So I, I think the Sanders campaign and, to, to a, a lesser extent, the Trump campaign, has put their finger on the problem of wage um, you know, lower wages, lower purchasing power, lower disposable income. Um, where the Democrats get it wrong is the Band-Aid approach of saying, well, let's just raise minimum wage to a livable wage, which, A, uh, usually results in unemployment at entrance-level jobs, B, results in small businesses not having enough funds to expand or pay their other workers, um, and C, only helps people at the very, very bottom. And there's a lot of people who are above minimum wage who are still working poor and still have stagnant wages. On the right, the answer tends to be, well, let's just eliminate the corporate tax or cut corporate taxes, and that will give corporations the ability to expand and hire and pay more. The, the problem has been, objectively, when we've done that in the past, that money, that profit, has not been plowed back into labor. Instead, it ends up going to top executives and goes into the company using those, that, that extra freed-up cash for uh, gambling in uh, the financial markets. So with, with that as the context, and I know I'm t uh, it's taken a long time to, to get out, right. my proposal is I want to cut corporate taxes but I want to do it in a way that guarantees increased income for labor. And, and the way I propose to do that is to give a $1.15 direct tax credit right on the tax bill to companies for every $1 they give in profit sharing to all of their employees. The benefit of that is that, A, the company saves money. Instead of paying out $100 million in taxes, they're paying out $85 million in, uh, in profit sharing, and they just save $15 million. So it does result in, in more free cash for them, number one. Number two, it guarantees that the money goes into the hands of the labor that actually created the profit in the first place. Number three, it doesn't just affect those who are making minimum wage. It affects everyone in the company, which could create a whole new era of labor management cooperation because now everyone's got a stake in the success of the company. And finally, unlike minimum wage, which is just mandated on all businesses, if your company's not making a profit, if you're, not, if, if you're just hanging on by a thread – you don't have to do anything more. You're not under a mandate to pay out more as you would be under minimum wage. Uh, this actually is a program that has worked in, in France and Germany. Uh, something like 80% of the large companies in Germany uh, do this, and it, it was originally instituted as part of uh, a tax reorganization, and now it's simply culturally built into the business sector. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And so I think people be very interested. I have not heard anything like that. I mean, you say it's implemented in France and Germany. So, I mean, it's already been tested. Uh, very interesting. I'm definitely going to research more into that. And um, now... Well, and, uh, and to give you an example, yeah, you know, fortunately, as a, as a teacher, I've, I've had some opportunity to, to do some research on this as an economics uh, professor. And I've looked at a couple of large companies like Centis, the uniform company, and Boston Beer, which brews Sam Adams, um, and Costco, which I, I'm, most of your listeners are probably familiar with, the big uh, warehouse outlet, wholesale outlet. In, a, in using their numbers, what they pay in taxes versus what they'd save and what they'd have to pay and how many employees they'd have, 
each of them would save tens of millions of dollars a year, and every single one of their employees would see an increase in their paycheck of between seven and nine thousand dollars a year, from the bottom on up. So it looks like the employees should be supporting you, and the you know the company should be you should be getting support from all sides on this, and it sounds like a win. Win. So, well, let's go to some other issues. You, you did talk about sure. your district uh, very um, well there. I feel like I understand that situation more so. Um, you did touch on the national debt and how much we're spending on interest, and that's with an interest rate lower than 1%. I mean, um, you know, in Jimmy Carter's days, it was like much, much higher. But, um, but yes, please uh, explain to us, um, you know, why well, the well, national right debt now- is so important. Sure. Right now, because of years under both Democrats and Republicans of spending more money than we take in, we are $20 trillion in debt. And a lot of Americans, you know, we use the phrase, um, you know, we just run the printing press. And a lot of Americans don't understand we don't just run a printing press. We actually borrow money from financial institutions to meet the, the bills that the nation has. So that means that in order to fund this $20 trillion debt, we borrow from Goldman Sachs, from Chase Manhattan, from Lloyds of London, from Deutsche Bank, from Credit Suisse, from the House of Saud, um, and then we pay them back with interest. And that interest comes from the individual federal income tax. At this point in our history, that is almost the interest alone, not even paying back the debt, but the interest is almost our third largest expenditure. It's five times more than we spend on roads and bridges. It's three times more than everything we spend on our, uh, on our veterans. It's completely out of control, but no one wants to address it because it means, it means being fiscally responsible. It means having a balanced budget. It means not going back to your district and, and dangling money before everyone, saying, I'm going to bring you this, and I'm going to bring you that, and I'm going to bring you this, because you've got 435 congressmen who are out there doing that, and that's why we're in this situation. Yeah, I mean, eventually there's that um, you know, event horizon where you just go too far, and, and we, don't, you know, we want to stay as far away as that world as we can um so uh definitely uh note taken there now you have here a federal education mandate um being a teacher um you know what what are some of your personal views on that i have this was actually the issue that launched me into the race um being a teacher for 19 years i'm watching students come out of the public schools and then come into college uh and in the college i teach at 60 percent of those students entering college are not college ready in math and English and need to take remedial courses. So clearly, in the last two decades, something has gone severely wrong in the education system. And when you trace it back, uh, both for No Child Left Behind, uh, which was uh, Bush's creation, and now Common Core, what you find is a common strand running throughout this. And that is, there's this sense, politicians want to prove to the people that they're doing something. So they say, we're going to have standardized tests, and we're going to test our kids and make sure they're learning, and, uh, and that'll, that'll prove to the world that we're doing something. Well, the problem is, all those standardized tests that are being imposed on kids in the uh, elementary and high school levels are multiple choice. It's not thinking questions. It's not an essay. It's not critical thinking where you draw in history and the arts and mathematics and economics and political science and anthropology and come up with a, with, with a, a complicated, rounded answer to a complicated problem. It's what's the answer, A, B, C, or D. And they get to college, and they're in the same frame of mind. You can have a whole complicated discussion on an issue, and, and a student will say, so what's the answer? Because they've been so trained in, I've got to get the right multiple choice A, B, C, D answer to get the right grade on the test. What's worse is that the schools at both the high school level 
And now at the college level, in order to receive funding, they need to prove to the state governments that they are making progress. So resources are now being devoted away from teaching and towards report writing. So if you're in education, the customer is no longer the student who needs to learn and acquire skills. The customer is now the state and the federal government who, because you're proving to them through all sorts of reports and data, and you're hiring people simply to do nothing but write reports, that you're meeting the standards they have come up with. So the entire focus on education is now on showing a politician at the next level above you that you've, you've reached some data point. What's happening to students, on the other hand, is a total crime. So long way of saying, if I get to Washington, first thing I'm going to try and do is end Common Core and end the entire structure that's been put on the states um, to, to engage in standard, a never-ending barrage of standardized testing. Thomas, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, okay. Actually, I'm sorry. One of my mics got out, but I'm, I'm back on here. Sorry. So, I, no. I was just waxing eloquent, <laughs> and you fell asleep. I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, very eloquent. Uh, you know, the, you want to get the um, the students, per se, like you were saying, to be the customer, and, um, and enough with the um, – you, you know, just the uh, charade of all these tests, which are just going to be forgotten in the pages of history anyways. Um, and that's so, exactly what it is, the yeah, charade. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And it sounds like you have a lot – I mean, if I, I – I honestly think if, you know, I can see a Green Party person, a Bernie supporter supporting you. I can see a Trump supporter supporting you. I can see independents supporting you. I can see the whole spectrum. You really – you know, sometimes I hear uh, someone on the left or the right, and, and they can be very divisive. That's not what I'm hearing from you at all. And, and there are people who do have the ability and, and to be able to see things in a very much consensus type of a way. And, and from what I'm hearing, um, uh, that's what that's kind of what it sounds like. So let me ask you. Well, I have uh, to tell you, you've pretty, you've pretty much hit the nail on the head in terms of my campaign, because my, my, I'm very open about my campaign strategy. I, there's no Republican running in this race. So for the 30% to a 35% of the district that is Republican, I need to hold them, and I need to show them that we have enough in common that it makes sense for them to vote for me over the incumbent Democrat. However, the district is a very liberal Democratic district, and because I'm a libertarian, I'm actually more liberal than the incumbent Democrat on a number of issues. On a woman's right to choose, I'm more liberal than he is. On environmental matters, um, I'm more liberal than he is. Uh, on the war against drugs, I'm more liberal than he is. So if I can hold the Republicans on fiscal issues and actually encourage enough independence and uh, Bernie Kratz, if you will, mm -hmm. to see that I'm more in line with their thinking than the current incumbent. I've actually put together a coalition that crosses the traditional political boundaries, and that's, that's the entire thrust of my campaign. Um, in fact, I'll tell you very, very quickly, uh, last night I was at two different campaign events. I went to uh, the college Republicans of Western Mass were having a meeting, so I just kind of crashed their party and introduced myself and talked about my platform. Uh, and when I left there, I then went to a gay bar and set up a GLBT meet and greet uh, for me later this month. So I'm reaching, <laughs> I'm reaching, you know, across the, the, the traditional spectrums. Well, that's actually you just addressed that question because I, I don't know how exactly I was going to ask it, but that certainly was the answer to it. And um, <laughs> so let me <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, uh, I've been asking everyone this. It's just kind of a fun question I like to ask people. Um, but uh, could you name some of your favorite people, uh, past or present, elected or not? Favorite people, past or present, elected or not. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, Harriet Tubman, because I, I, I always root for the, the, the underdog who's kind of breaking the rules but doing the right thing. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, 
eloquent, wonderful. Friedrich Hayek, uh, the um, the uh, economist who wrote who uh, wrote uh, the Road to Serfdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, who else could I name? Uh, off the top of my head, those three people come right to the top. Well, no, that sounds great, and I, I'm sure there's more. And but no, we're just trying to get uh, you know just off the top of your head there, and. Uh, Thomas, it has been a pleasure. I'm glad to have talked to you, and um, it's just exciting interviewing all these people from across the spectrum that are the only third party or independent choice in their specific district who are going to be on the ballot, who deserve to be on the ballot, and who deserves to get the media attention and uh, to be in the debates, etc. Um, so if people want to check you out, again, it's Simmons, the number four, congress.com. And Thomas is running as uh, Thomas Simmons here is running as a libertarian for the U.S. House of uh, Representatives, District Number One in Massachusetts. And it sounds like he's getting uh, reaching out to people on all sides of the spectrum. His only opponent is uh, one Democrat candidate, and uh, so we're looking forward to him to be on, in the debates uh, if there's going to be the debates if um, the other candidate is even up to it, I guess. But Thomas has promised he'll do as many debates as is needed. And um, so any final words of wisdom, Thomas? We appreciate your time, sir. Uh, my only words of wisdom are vote your heart. Get out there and vote for the person you agree with, not the person you think is going to win. The only wasted vote is voting for someone you don't agree with. Sounds good. And people will be able to uh Re-listen to this interview plus the other, um, you know, 25 plus interviews we have so far at libertarianprogressive.com. This will be up there in about 24 hours, and and sh- share them. Just say, hey, here's some people that are uh, candidates, and um, these are some other options that uh, you're not being told about uh, the truth about the 2016 elections and. Um, well, thank you again for taking the time to enlighten our audience about your campaign, and uh, good luck to your campaign. I hope you have thank a nice Thank you very much. Thomas. Thank you for having me. All right. You're okay, very welcome. Bye-bye. Take care, sir. Bye-bye.